I have, I have racing thoughts. It's been that way since I was a kid. I'm constantly, it doesn't matter if I'm asleep or if I'm awake, I'm constantly thinking of a hundred things at one time. <sighs> Shackled, cuffed, and wearing a red jail suit. Red instead of orange because guards consider John Hughes unpredictable and dangerous. Tattooed on the back of Hughes' head, the words, casualty of war. Because what you want is to die. That's correct. That's the only thing worthy of a warrior, I guess you could say. Death. Hughes wants to be put to death. He admits killing a man in Ohio, stabbing him to death. Then on the run from Ohio police with his girlfriend and two other people, Hughes says he killed Valentin Kurlachuk shot him in the mouth in this rest area north of Platte City, Missouri. Hughes says he had to kill to regain something very precious to him, control, control over his passengers. I pulled into this rest area and that was a way for me to gain control, to, to show, I don't know, I guess I would assert my dominance, I guess you could say. That'd be the way to put it. And it shut everybody up for a while. One man dead, three passengers petrified. Later they wanted out, but I told them that nobody was getting out of that truck, period, without, without a bullet in their head. And I asked, did anybody want out? <laughs> and they said no. So You don't feel bad about killing uh, anyone? Not personally, that I've personally done myself, no. I just view things as objects, people, animals, that, Trees, cars, they're just all the same to me. What do, you, what do you see in their face right before they die? Usually fear. John Hughes admits to killing people in Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio. As far as the murders that I've been a part of, but there's been quite a few. A dozen? At least. 20? Under. Somewhere around the 15? Somewhere around in there. Hughes doesn't believe in God, but he can recite the verse tattooed on his cheek from the book of John. And everyone that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. According to the Christian Bible, everybody can't have the spirit of God in them. So you don't have the spirit of God? I de not according to the Bible. If you're going by the, that route. It, no, I definitely do not. The tattoo of a lion on his forearm is how Hughes sees himself. I'm a lion and I see everybody else is men. <laughs> and releasing a lion from captivity, Hughes warns, would mean more killings. I wouldn't let me go, no. I wouldn't advise anyone to, I mean, not unless, <laughs> not unless they want a lion loose in the streets. Because you'd kill again? More than positive. John has been representing himself in court, but is currently looking for an attorney because, like he said, he wants to be put to death. And Larry, my entire interview with John Hughes can be seen and heard on... ...immediately. I kept those memories because I knew that I was the only person that was going to be able to tell them what happened when we got to the hospital. And when I got there, the first thing I said was, call the doctors. Second thing was the blood type. Third thing was, call the cops, because they've got to, they've got to find him. And so I had to remember as much as I could remember. When this man shot my daughter, my first reaction was to snap back to my childhood, to the pain that had happened to me back then, my marriage, my entrapment by society. This man was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He had more power because he had a gun. He was in control and I was not. And I had, there was nothing I could do. And I stood there and I looked at Christy reaching and the blood that just kept gushing out of her mouth. And, and I, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You just stand there trapped. And then, and then the gun kept firing and firing and firing and it, it, it made, it was monotonous. It just kept going. It was like a slow motion picture. And then he swung around towards me, and I, and this is something that I did not recall when I was explaining to the cops because there, it, was, it wasn't like a movie when I was telling them. I was telling them what happened, the important details. He shot my kids. I pushed him. I ran. And when he swung around, he was pointing when he swung around, it hit the tips of my fingers. The gun hit the tips of my fingers, mm -hmm. and that snapped me, and I went, Wait a minute. I'm not trapped by society. I don't care if he is bigger. If I stand here and I say, 
Yeah, here, take the keys. I mean, there's nothing I can do. You win because you have the gun. My kids are going to die. And I'm not going to let my kids die. And so instead of giving him the keys, I feigned throwing the keys. He did not take time to point the gun and shoot me, obviously, because he would have shot me the same way he did the kids. When he was swinging in the direction of the keys, firing the gun, he hit my arm. Everybody says, you sure were lucky. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I Safers interviewed McDaniel the day after Lauren Giddings was reported missing in June of 2011. Reporter Michelle Casada found him standing outside the apartment building where he and Giddings had lived and that we now know was the scene of the crime. He talks about joining Giddings' friends to look for his law school classmate and how they entered her apartment to see if there was anything wrong. It was also the first time McDaniel found out that a portion of Lauren Giddings' body had been recovered by police from the dumpster where he had put it. Knowing now that McDaniel had murdered and dismembered Giddings, the interview provides a glimpse inside the mind of a killer as he builds his story and his alibi. Take a look. The person that was living there? Yeah, Lauren was my neighbor. Um, we're just trying to find out where she is at this point. I mean, no one has seen her since Saturday. I mean, the last time anyone heard from her was an email that she sent out, and I mean, no one's heard from her since. Did you see her hang out with anyone at the time? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, I've always hear noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, she just recently graduated from Mercer. Yeah, she and I were we were both JD students. Um, we graduated back in May. What kind of person was she? I mean, how did you? What did you see? Her? I mean, she's as nice as can be. I mean, very personable, very much a people person. Do you know anybody that, any enemies she might have had, somebody that might want to hurt her? No, I mean, we're, we don't know where she is. I mean, the only thing we can think is that maybe she went out running and someone snatched her. Because, I mean, we went, at, we went over, one of her friends had a key, we went inside and tried to see if there was anything amiss, but, I mean, she had a door jam that was sitting right by it, so there was no sign that anyone broke in. I mean, the door was locked when everyone got here. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. I mean, what about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, any, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? Right. I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay.